uh, mindset is hugely important. And, and to me, that's, that is the first step and continues to be the most important step in, in everything that you're doing, because we're kind of sold this, this fake bill of goods that at age 40, um, you just go ahead and you just go ahead and put that weight on. You go ahead and get put on your first high blood pressure medicine and you play golf on weekends and that's okay. And that's, that's cause that's average. So that's, what's expected. We're sold this societal bill of goods, you know, based on what is average and based is what it, on what is expected. And, uh, it's, it's not true. It's a, it's a fake societal construct and you can break through that. And aging is a real thing. The effects of aging are, are real, but you can do a lot to mitigate that. We just don't, just giving up is what most people do. Most people just give up to the passage of time and say, uh, well, it's, it's just expected that, that I'm not going to work out. And, you know, you won't, you won't see me out there doing uh, doing crazy fitness competitions, or uh, you know, getting in the cage or getting on the mat and mixing it up with people 30 years younger. You certainly won't see me putting on full kit and sliding down a rope out of a helicopter somewhere in a combat zone. I'm Dr. Mike Simpson, and this is the Tom Roland Podcast. What's going on, everybody? Today, we have a very special guest. I'm very excited to introduce you to Dr. Mike Simpson. He just wrote a book called Honed, How to Keep Your Edge as a Man After the Age of 40. And this is a great book. It's a great book. I read it cover to cover in an afternoon, and I don't do that for many books. This one happened to be about physical fitness after the age of 40, not just physical fitness, but overall health. It addresses sleep, vitamins, supplements, what you're eating, what your your hydration levels are, how you can um, be at your best when a lot of people think that you should be in decline after the age of 40. And it's just not true. You are nowhere near done at age 40. And Dr. Mike Simpson knows this firsthand because he was in the uh, soft community. He was a ranger, went to ranger school, then later in life went to medical school and went back into the soft community and was deployed at age 48, keeping up with the absolute animals of the military and being able to do that at a very advanced age for that profession, 48 years old. Not only that, but he trains Thai boxing, he trains Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and he is older than me. He's 55 years old now, and he looks like he's 35. He obviously has the formula down. He has a lot of really good things to say. So whether you're 35 or whether you're 75, this book is really, really good. And if you're 25, I would suggest reading this book too, because you're going to know what's coming and you're going to know what is important and the lessons that Mike has learned in order to stay in really good shape into your 50s, into your 60s, into your 70s. And what that is all about, as far as this podcast is concerned, is that we all like to do stuff. We all like to hunt. We all like to fish. We all like to spend time with our kids. We all want to hike up mountains. We all want to see beautiful sunsets and sunrises. We all want to be outside. And we want to be able to do that for as long as possible at the highest degree possible. That's why I spend so much time being fit. I want to be able to do the things that my kids want to do with me. Hiking backpacking, fishing long days, fishing in rivers, fishing in the ocean, fishing everywhere, wading, all of these things require you to be in good physical condition. And the better physical condition you're in, not only the better are you going to be able to do those things, but the longer you're going to be able to do those things. And I don't know about you, but I want to do them well into my 80s, well into my 90s. I want to be able to be out there on the bow of the boat, catching tarpon when I'm 90 years old. I want to be able to walk 
and, and wade in a river when I'm 80 years old and catch trout. I want to be able to do this for as long as possible. I want to be the fittest grandfather on the planet, and I don't even have grandchildren yet, but I'm preparing now. This book is an outstanding resource, and Mike is an outstanding resource. He's a guy that that walks the walk and talks the talk. He is in great shape. And I'm really excited to introduce you to Dr. Mike Simpson, who just wrote this book. You can check out his podcast. You can check out his books. You can check him out on social media. He is a great resource, somebody that's uh, um, that I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Mike Simpson. All right, here we go. Dr. Mike, how are you? Good, Tom. How are you? Man, I'm couldn't be better, really. I'm uh, I'm doing great. I just got back from an amazing trip with my kids and just riding high. <laughs> That's a good feeling. Yeah. How are you? Doing really good. Doing really good. Weather's starting to cool down here in Texas. We're about to get our our false fall. Uh, it's <laughs> we're gonna <laughs> that'll be setting in probably in the next week or so. So that's always a good feeling. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little break from the heat. So what part of Texas okay. are you in? I'm in Central Texas. I'm just north of Austin. Okay. All right. There's a, we have uh, one of the the Waypoint offices in Austin. I need to get over there and, and check it out. But Austin, man, what a town that's growing so fast. Yeah, it really is. It's uh, it's a little bit crazy. Have you lived there for a long time? I've lived here since 2012. Okay. Yeah. You've bit. seen, you've seen a good amount of change, I would imagine. Yeah. The I-35 corridor is, uh, is getting pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I know I, I went to Austin, not uh, I don't know. It was about 10 years ago. I would imagine that it's changed a lot now. Um, well, I read your book and really, really liked it. It it was an easy book for me to read because it is, I mean, I don't know. It was like you wrote it for me. It's called Honed, um, Keeping Your Edge Over 40. So um, you you have an interesting story, an interesting background. Um, I'd love to for you to kind of Give us a little background on on you and and why you're capable and um, ready to write this book. It's pretty interesting, really. Okay. Uh, well, I had I, I think I had kind of a non traditional. Uh, I had a, definitely had a non traditional journey to to being in medicine and a little bit of a non traditional journey in life. Um, I grew up in a small town. I was born in the Los Angeles area in Redondo Beach, actually, but spent my formative years in a really uh, small town called Tehachapi, California, which most people have not heard of. Um, uh, very uh, blue collar, uh, hunting, fishing, a lot of outdoor mm. stuff that really kind of shaped me and shaped my goals uh, at, again in my formative years. And I ended up joining the army. Uh, two weeks out of high school, and that was 1984, shipping off uh, to become an airborne ranger, which I did for my initial four years, my initial four year enlistment. Thought I might want to get out and pursue a career in some type of federal law enforcement, but um, stayed in the National Guard, got assigned to a Special Forces National Guard unit, and we ended up getting called up for uh, Desert, Sh Desert Shield, Desert Storm, although we did not deploy. But I got back on active duty during that time. And I really realized that that was kind of a better fit for me um, going back on active duty. Mm -hmm. I'd gone to college in the interim or kind of dabbled in college, I should say. And I was a corrections officer, but I was really more comfortable in the military. So after I finished special forces qualification course and language school, I I left the National Guard and, and signed an active duty contract, went to the 7th Special Forces Group hmm. as a Special Forces Demolition Sergeant or Special Forces Engineer Sergeant, depending on who you're talking to. Did that for a few years and then decided to be a Special Forces Medical Sergeant. So I cross-trained uh, to become a medic. Really enjoyed that. Really, in, That's when I really started to find out that uh, I had a knack for medicine and that it was something I was really interested in. So the logical progression for me was either to be, become a physician assistant or to go to medical school. And mm -hmm. ultimately, I, I went to medical school, went to emergency medicine residency, then went back to the special operations community assigned to the Joint Medical Augmentation Unit. Um, where I did six years and five deployments in the global war on terror. And then retired out of the, from the army, uh, in 2016, uh, I was the chair of emergency medicine at Fort hood when I retired and, um, 
that kind of brings us up to the right. present segment in life. But as you can see, I did a lot of things pretty late in life. Well, I, that's I what I was undergraduate. Yeah. I finished my undergraduate on active duty and, and went to medical school and was an intern at age 40. So wow. I was always a little bit older than my peers. <laughs> I guess so. Um, yeah. So let's, let's wind it back a little bit. The, the, in your press kit, it says you did your last deployment at age 48. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. That so is that is how much older um, is that than everyone else deploying you in your book, you said there was one person that was around your age. At, yeah, at well, one. he really, and he really wasn't even around my age. He was, uh, <laughs> the, the platoon sergeant was the only one even remotely close to my age. And he was in his mid thirties. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, let's say I was, you know, 13 years older than him, uh, 29 ish years, you know, 30, 29 ish years older than most of that platoon. Wow. That, that in the, in the specific instance that I'm, you're talking, referring to in the introduction right. uh, when we're on that mission. So uh, quite a bit older. So yeah. most of the people on that, on that mission, uh, I was old enough to be their father. <laughs> wow. And uh, how much, how much do you think um, attitude is playing into that as far as um, being able to kind of hold your own there? And, and you, you discuss it in the book a little bit, but you know, as, as it, I always like talking to to people like yourself, and I've had a lot of uh, special operations people and different fighters and different people that are on the extreme edge mm -hmm. of something because it seems like whatever lessons that they have learned on the battlefield or in the mm -hmm. octagon or whatever, you can apply to life in a, in a much gentler way. But like in your in your in your story. You're 48. You're deploying with people that are, are 20 to 30 years younger than you. How much, just before we get into the physical and how you've been able to, to, to stay fit and, and, and ready for duty, how much does, it, does mindset and attitude play into that? Uh, mindset is hugely important. And, and to me, that's, that is the first step and continues to be the most important step. In, in everything that you're doing, because we're kind of sold this, this fake bill of goods that at age 40, um, you just go ahead and you just go ahead and put that weight on. You go ahead and get put on your first high blood pressure medicine and you play golf on weekends and that's okay. And that's, that's cause that's average. So that's, what's expected. And your so, eyes go so bad. Nobody, <laughs> What's that? Yeah. And your eyes go bad. That's what everybody told me. As soon as yeah. you turn 40, you're going to need glasses. Well, I'm yeah. 53. I don't need them yet. Yeah. But See, the same thing. But is you're yeah, talking we're, about. We're, we're sold this societal bill of goods, you know, based on what is average and based is what is, on what is expected. And uh, it's, it's not true. It's a, it's a fake societal construct and you can break through that. And aging is a real thing. The effects of aging are, are real. But you can do a lot to mitigate that. We just don't, just giving up is what most people do. Most people just give up to the passage of time and say, uh, well, it's, it's just expected that, that I'm not going to work out. And, you know, you won't, you won't see me out there doing, uh, doing crazy fitness competitions or, uh, you know, getting in the cage or getting on the mat and mixing it up with people 30 years younger. You certainly won't see me putting on full kit and sliding down a rope out of a helicopter somewhere in a combat zone, because that's just not expected. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you make your own rules. I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. And, you know, I, I was told in high school that uh, pretty about midway through my high school career that I probably wasn't going to amount to much because I wasn't dumb, but, uh, I was a little bit on the lazy side and <laughs> I, I kind of figured out early on in high school that, football girls and cars, not necessarily in that order were a lot more fun than anything that they were showing me. And what did they know anyway? I mean, they were high school teachers, right? What did they really know about in a small town? What did they really know about life? So I didn't apply myself. I didn't do homework. Um, I would do pretty uh, well enough on tests that I would pass classes. And I graduated 102nd out of 122 students in my senior class. So out of high school, you know, the, the prospects that look appeared to be open to me, it didn't appear to be a lot there. It was, you know, most mm -hmm. people probably would say, well, it's a good thing he's going in the army because at least he'll have that going for him. Um, 
definitely, if you would have asked any of my teachers, any of my advisors or any of my classmates on graduation day. So do you think Mike will be a doctor some, someday? Everybody would have just laughed at that. I mean, just the prospect of it was completely ludicrous. In fact, when I went to my 20 year high school reunion, um, we had a, a they, they established a website and a message board and I was in medical school and I was doing, uh, doing rotations at the time. And I was doing an OB, OB gen rotation during the time that the reunion was going to occur. And I posted on there. I said, Hey, I, I want to try to make it. I'm in medical school. I'm doing an obstetrician gynecology rotation during that time frame. So I'm going to, I'm going to try, but I can't guarantee it. And everybody thought that was my way of making a joke. <laughs> They didn't, they didn't even think that was serious. And then I showed up and they're like, Oh, I thought your joke on the message board was so funny. So what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm, I'm in my third year of medical school. And, and they thought I was kidding. So, you know, and, and again, this was, I, I was in my late thirties, pretty much everyone in my class had was well settled into their career mm -hmm. yeah. and was at mid management or higher in whatever their chosen field was. There were a couple of physicians in my class who were attendings who had been in practice for quite some time because they had gone high school, undergraduate medical school directly into uh, residency and practice. Right. Wow. That had to be, uh, that had to be um, interesting to be that much older than all your peers in medical school. And, um, but, but in, you know, looking at it from, from my perspective, you had so much more worldly experience having already been on deployment and in the military, that had to be some sort of an advantage as well as kind of a disadvantage that you were older than everyone. Um, and again, mindset has to play into that, I guess, to where you just, you just laser focus you don't yeah. care about any of that stuff. Yeah. I think, uh, if I, if I rate a difficulty, uh, on a scale in, in medical school, first year of medical school was to me was by far the hardest. And most people will tell you that second year of medical school is the most difficult because you really, uh, that's when you have a, a pathology and a lot of the really difficult uh, subjects and they're really piled on you in huge, huge volumes. The volume of information that you're digesting on a weekly basis in your second year of medical school is immense. But I was a lot more comfortable in in second year. First year to me was was just it, it was kind of an extension of undergraduate in just kind of the raw science that we're doing. And although I had just finished undergraduate, I didn't have the approach and uh, similar study habits to my peers. So stuff took me a little bit more time. Second year was a little bit easier because having already been a medic, I could see the applicability in everything that we were learning. You know, mm -hmm. we, we'd be talking about diseases that I had legitimately seen before. This wasn't just theory <laughs> mm -hmm. for me. Right. Um, and then third and fourth year, when you're doing clinical rotations, to me, that was extremely easy because it's as a, as a medical student, there's not a lot put on your shoulders. You know, it's, it's not like you're going in solo and doing surgery on your own. So you're getting evaluated really on, on how you talk to patients, how you do a patient history, how you do a physical exam. These were all things I was comfortable with. You know, I was, I was in my late thirties going into a room and talking to somebody and, and listening to them and getting their story and a physical exam, something I had done hundreds, if not thousands of times before as a medic, these were all easy. So then if you look at, it's funny too, because if you look at my grades in medical school, first year I, I looked like somebody who, uh, was, was doing okay, but you know, I, there was a C in there, mm -hmm. uh, sec, second year, very solid student. And then, and then clerkship third year and fourth year, I'm above my peers all of a sudden, because this is stuff that's, that's easy to me. This is basically like going to work every day. Right. And I'd been in the workforce before and, and many of my peers had not. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that's interesting. One of the, one of the kind of underlining themes that we have when, when I talk to so many different people on the podcast is, um, people that follow their passion, people that, that have seen something that they want to do and made a, a, a real choice that mm -hmm. that's the road they're going to go down. Maybe it's a fishing guide. Maybe it's a hunting guide. Maybe it's going to medical school in your thirties. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that decision, um, when, when you decided like, you, you probably could have gone on your medical, uh, on your military career and done other things, but that had to be kind of a crossroads where you decide, okay, this is, this is what I'm going to do. And this is why I'm going to do it. Uh, it, yeah, it was a tremendous crossroads. It was very pivotal. And I, it wasn't just a moment. It was a, a series of moments mm. spread out over a pretty long period of time. Initially, 
I wanted to become a physician assistant, which is what a lot of special forces medics do, because there's an easy transition to that. Um, and it, it's considered a faster way to get there. Um, a, a lot of special forces medics do it. And that was what I wanted to do. And I had started doing my prerequisites as an undergraduate. And then the PA branch came out and said, we don't, we don't want people over a certain age and we don't want people over a certain number of years in service, because what we don't want is we're going to train you to be a PA and then you're going to give your, your payback time. We don't want you just doing that and then getting out and taking and taking a high paying job in the civilian sector. We want longevity out of people that if we're going to invest in training you, we want the possibility that you're going to be around for a long, long time and make Colonel, maybe even, you know, make general someday. Um, we want that. So we're going to put a cap on the number of years of service you can have and the end, the age that which you can apply. And uh, I was barred from applying under both of those conditions. Hmm. So a little bit discouraging and then uh, had some, some peers start to talk to me about going to medical school, which I thought was kind of a pipe dream. And, you know, I said, you know, it's, that's a lot more involved. First, I have to finish undergraduate, finish undergraduate with all of the pre-med requirements. I got to take the MCAT. I don't even know what's on that test, but I know it's hard. Then I have to apply to medical school. They're going to take a look at how old I am. You know, this is, you know, life is not a Patch Adams movie. <laughs> am I really going to be able to get it? And then I'm going to have to pay for it and residency and everything else. And uh, I had some, some personal uh, inward conversations and, and kind of worked it out and realized that this was something that I could do. And, uh, five of us started, five of us started out on that path, all guys that I had been, uh, through medic training with either, uh, they were either 18 Delta army special forces medics, or they were seal medics. And two of us made it as far as, as taking an MCAT study course and midway through that MCAT study course, the guy who was in that course with me, um, had to drop out for personal reasons. Hmm. So I went in alone to take the MCAT and went through the application process on my own. And I got accepted at uh, three different medical schools in the state of Texas. And I got accepted to where I ultimately matriculated, which was the uniform services university of health sciences in Bethesda, Maryland. And, uh, yeah, there was a lot of things that could have derailed me, to, including 9-11 happened mm -hmm. in there in the interim. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there was a moment that was in the, I was in the middle of uh, interview season for medical schools. I had already interviewed at some and was waiting to interview at others when 9-11 happened. And I was this close to just pulling my application <laughs> and saying, well, you know, hey, there's a war on. So I'm needed on a team as a special forces medic or, or an intelligence sergeant, or as a, a team sergeant, um, I need to not go anywhere. And I had a company sergeant major who pulled me aside and he said, look, he said, we're not going anywhere anytime soon. This could be a couple of years. There's a, there's a lot of people in line ahead of us to deploy. And he said, I think you would, you would be needlessly putting this on hold. And he said, if, if you close that door, it might not reopen mm. for you. But if you go through that door, you can come back to the community as a physician. And that's, and I talk about in the book, the, uh, you know, the, that, uh, the group commander even had yeah. a conversation with me about that, that, and that was, that was what I always wanted was, it was to come back to the soft community as a physician, but the Sergeant major emphasized to me how important that was going to be for the force. And, and I, I saw that he was right. And sure enough, uh, it ended up that, uh, my, my company that I was assigned to, the day that I out processed and left for medical school, they didn't deploy for three years anyway. So it, I would have sat around watching the war unfold on television for three years and missing my opportunity to go to medical school. Right. And uh, in the end, I think what I did was definitely right for me. And it was definitely right for the soft community because of the capacity that I ultimately was able to deploy in. Right. Good advice that you were given. Yeah. Um, so during this time you're thinking about, um, you're thinking about going back, mm -hmm. you know, once you finish your education and, and get your credentials, you're thinking about going back. You're also aging at this yeah. point and you're also <laughs> thinking, okay, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're thinking, okay, well I got to be able to keep up. So like on the physical mm -hmm. side, what are you, what are you doing at this time to maintain 
your your fitness probably not gaining fitness May, yeah. i don't know maybe you are i don't know but uh, like what are where are you fitness wise yeah so i started off my my first year of med school i started off with i, I had this insane plan for how every day was going to work for me and uh, i i lived at the last i lived at the sh- uh, just just next to the shady grove metro stop uh, outside of DC for those who live in the area, they know exactly where I'm talking about. So my, my plan initially was I would, I would get up every morning, put on workout clothes with my book bag on my back. I would get on the Metro. I would take the Metro, uh, to school, put my stuff in in my locker and I would work out. There was a, a gym there, a really decent gym there on campus. So I would work out in the morning for about an hour, get cleaned up, get in uniform. And, uh, because it, it's a, it's a, uh, Eustis is actually a DOD school. You wear a military uniform to school every day. Um, I would go to my lectures and go to my labs during the day, then study in the library in the evening and then, and then come home. And that lasted probably about three weeks <laughs> when I realized that that just wasn't sustainable. I was already not getting enough sleep because of how much studying I had to do. So then on top of that, having to get up at four o'clock in the morning, to ride the Metro and to have time to work out before that first lecture. Um, it just, just didn't work out. So needless to say, my fitness started to slip and there were times when I was able to make up for it. You know, I would, I would always, anytime we had a break of any kind, I would make fitness a priority that, you know, if, if I don't do anything else, you know, everybody else might want to go camping, go fishing, just, you know, do nothing, but, you know, drink somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, I may, I tried to make fitness a priority every time we had a break, but of course that's not, I talk about in the book, that's not a good way to go either. Right. Cause then Mm -hmm. your fitness level is doing, doing this up and down, up and down. That's kind of a recipe for injury. And I did have some injuries in there. Probably the only thing that kept me fit to any degree of fitness during my first two years of medical school was uh, we actually had a C league. uh, The the school had a C league hockey team Hmm. and I played on the C league hockey team. So hockey was, uh, was my outlet and was my way to maintain at least some level of fitness throughout all that. When I did my clerkships in, in third and fourth year, again, I tried to make it more of a priority and, and get it in as often as I could and, you know, get up, even if it was just getting up and going for a two mile run in the morning. But, um, that was easier in fourth year than it was in third. But again, knowing that, you know, eventually there, a a time is going to come that I'm going to finish school. I'm going to finish residency and I'm going to go back to a military unit. And I want that to be a soft unit. Mm -hmm. So I want to be in the kind of shape that they look at me and they don't go, no, that, that there's no way that we're taking right. that guy. Just, you know, just, just based on what he looks like, there's no way we're taking him. I didn't want to hear that. So uh, always tried to prioritize it. And again, had difficulties in, you know, in residency just was a wreck for a lot of reasons. Cause the, you're working, it's, you're working crazy shifts in, in emergency medicine. You have three different shifts that you can work. Uh, some places schedule, set it up differently, but most places you work on a, basically a, a day, evening and night shift rotation. Um, so you're, you're constantly moving around back and forth through those. Sometimes you're, and sometimes as a resident, your day off um, is what we call a DOMA day off my ass <laughs> is you, you, you're supposed to be off that day, but you have to go to grand rounds because you have to go to mandatory lectures. So you don't get that day off. And there was one point in my first year of residency where I actually went 58 straight days without a, with where I had to physically show up to work somewhere every single day, which is ironic because when I went through Ranger school in 1986, Ranger school was 58 days as well. And that's why that number <laughs> always sticks in my head. Um, you're not eating right. You don't have time in, in working in an ER as a resident. It's not like they say, okay, go ahead and go ahead and take that 45 minutes for lunch. That doesn't happen. Right. So you're grabbing stuff on the go constantly, which means you're eating crap. Um, I was trying to do stuff like eat right before a shift and re eat right after a shift. And that wasn't working well for me. So I in turn year, I gained a lot of weight Yeah, and I guarantee if you would have checked my labs, I guarantee my cortisol was out of whack and everything else. You know, that's a pretty similar situation 
Maybe, maybe on the extreme when you're talking about residency and how fast mm-hmm. 58 days in a row. But when you, when you have, you know, you're, you're over 40, you've got three kids, you have a job, you have yeah. some sort of ha- hobbies. Um, <clears throat> the reason I work out in the morning always is because when I tried to work out in the afternoons, I have three kids of my own and there was always something, you know, it was clear as a bell in the morning. Clear. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, you go, you go do your long run today. You go do whatever mm-hmm. today. But then it's like, oh, we have a teacher's meeting. Oh, we have a wrestling match. Oh, there's mm-hmm. a soccer game. Oh, you, you need to go talk to Hannah's teacher. This or th- something would always happen. You put the mm-hmm. run off, you put the workout off, you put whatever. And I finally just got to the point to where it's like, you know, I just have to, regardless of whether it looks clear in the afternoon, regardless of what time I'm leaving the dock in the morning, I have to get up in the morning and do this. Otherwise it's not going to get done. And, and you have a similar philosophy, I guess. But, but when you're, when you're talking about um, like the state that you were in right there, it's really not all that different than a lot of people, like probably a lot of the people that you're writing this book for. So let's Mm -hmm. talk about like when somebody is in that situation um, and maybe not to the extreme of residency, but you know, more, more like what I'm talking about with the kids and the responsibilities and the job Mm -hmm. and, and friends and your wife wants you to do things. And, you know, you've got all of these things. How does someone, you know, over 40 that's being fed this line of of bull like you talked about that that Mm -hmm. yeah you're supposed to just gain weight yeah when you're 40 you're not supposed to be doing crossfit yeah when you're 40 Mm -hmm. you're not supposed to be wrestling or doing jujitsu or any of that Mm -hmm. stuff like yeah just take it easy man everything's fine take these pills and it's gonna be all right like how does someone buy yourself a fat fat guy shirt and just live with it right well (laughs) okay help us out a little bit with with from your perspective of of how someone is to reverse that because it doesn't feel good. That's not a good feeling. And a lot of people that, that listen to this podcast are right there and they Mm -hmm. are thinking like, man, I want to get back to where I was, or maybe, you know, you had a great thing in your book where you talked about like, there are really three different types of athletes. There's like, Mm -hmm. can you explain that? You were, you were saying that there was the, the, the high school guy that had it once. Mm -hmm. Then there was a late bloomer. What, what what was that all of it that you had? So you you have people that were in shape at one point and, and then life just got in the way. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and, or maybe injuries got in the way. It could, could be one, one of two Mm -hmm. things. Right. And, and they kind of crave to get back to that, but they don't really have a recipe for it. And maybe they go back and they try and, and how do they try? They try by doing the same things they were doing 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And those, those hurt now and they don't seem to work. Right. Used to be, I could do this and I can't do that. And now I'm discouraged. Right. Because, uh, because I'm trying to jump right back into it. So there's a lot, there's a lot of, a lot of manufactured obstacles to your success there because you're trying to do what coach so-and-so had you do back then. And number one, he wasn't really having you do the right stuff because we didn't know back then what we know Mm -hmm. now. Number two, your body's different. He was coaching a 20 something year old. He wasn't coaching a 40 something year old. So you need to look at that as well. So that's, that's one group of people The the, the, I used to do it and I want it back, but now I'm finding all these obstacles. That's one. Uh, Then you have the late bloomers who maybe were never into Mm -hmm. that and they just have no idea where to start. Mm -hmm. And there's so much conflicting information out there and they might do something. Well, I heard this, you, you brought up CrossFit. And, uh, Hey, I heard this CrossFit thing's a a good deal. So they go in there and they check out and they're like, guys are kipping and guys are hanging, doing stuff on rings and guys are doing power cleans. And they're like, Oh my God. So they're either going to get, they're going to get injured, Mm -hmm. uh, or discouraged, uh, or or maybe a combination of both, you know, maybe just intimidated or the other. Whoa. I've never even seen that before. Like I'm not going to be doing that. Yeah. If, if that, if my first introduction ever to exercise was just walking in to a wad, I would probably turn around and just run out. Sure. And And many (laughs) people do. (laughs) Yeah. It's intimidating. It's Mm -hmm. it's really intimidating. And then the third group are are guys that, uh, that continue to work out and, and they're still staying pretty fit, but they're noticing it's, you know what, that mile six is getting a little bit harder or a little bit slower 
or, or getting that weight up is a little bit more difficult or, you know, this pain in my shoulder is just not going away. Mm -hmm. Even after I rest three or four days mm -hmm. and then, you know, try to give myself a rest over the weekend, that pain in my elbow, wrist, knee, hip, it's just not quite going away. So I think I need to approach this a little bit differently. So, you know, you have the used to getting back into it, late bloomers, and the, it's just not as easy as it was say two or three years ago. And all of those people need to recognize that, you know, you are the age you are, there's nothing that you can do about that. If you're out of shape, you didn't get out of shape overnight. Uh, it's going to take you at least as long to get back in shape as it did to get that you, you took getting out of shape and probably longer. That's a really good point right there yeah. that could you know, easily you know, get glossed over. But that, that is, yeah. that is something that, you know, people, people don't realize, like if they've been, you know, you, you just had a baby and you stopped working out and now your baby's three or four years old and now you're start. you know, there's a mommy's day out program and there's, they're mm -hmm. starting school. And now, now it's starting to loosen up a little bit and there is some time available. You're not getting back to where you were in a month or nope. six months. <laughs> Like what you said, really, when I read that, I was like, you know what? That's, that's just about exactly the way it is. Like if you took yeah. three years off, it's going to really take you about three years to get back to, I mean, you can make substantial progress, but when it comes mm -hmm. to durability and mm -hmm. flexibility and mobility and being able to not only do it once, but then be able to do it the next day and the next day mm -hmm. and sustainability, I guess is what we would call that. Yeah. That takes a while. That's what yeah. takes a while. I mean, you can get it to where you can drop your resting heart rate and you can, you can make, you know, you can go back to your, your, your next doctor's appointment and he's going to be like, wow, what are you doing? But can you keep that up and going mm -hmm. at a real high intensity at 45, you, you kind of need to ease back a little bit. In my opinion, I'm interested in what you have to say too. Yeah, no, it, because two things are happening during that three years. The, the one thing that's happening is you're not working out. So you're getting the deleterious effects of not working out. And then also father time has a hand in it. So even if you would have been working out, you still would have been aging during that three years. That's, that's unavoidable. And three years doesn't seem like a lot of time, but when you're not working out, that's magnified. Mm -hmm. the, the, the two, it's not, it's not two plus two. It's, you know, or it's not, we'll say it's not five plus five, it's five times five, hmm. you know, or three times three, whatever it is. It's not, it's, it's not adding it together. It's multiplying it when these things, these things are working together, but it's and like you said, you can maybe in three months or six months, you can be like, okay, I'm back in a groove again. This feels good. That's when you really start to climb back out of that hole, but don't expect to be putting up that same PR or running that same time for quite some time. And yeah, it could be as long, you know, again, as long as you weren't working out, that's how long it could take. The, the needle on the scale might not go back to where you were three years ago for another three years. Mm. And you need to accept that. And it's, it's about progress. It's not about perfection. It's not about, I've been in the gym two weeks. I should be exactly where I was when I was 35. Years old. <laughs> that's just not going to happen. Yeah. But to, to reflect back on, on kind of the initially, uh, uh, how the, how this, the, the question was, was framed as far as, you know, people having difficult schedules. Uh, for me, it's all about flipping the switch and making that mental commitment. And I, I think a huge part of that, at least for me has been, you know, what I call the warrior athlete philosophy, which is if you look at working out as a hobby, well, it's something that I dabble in. Well, then it's something that gets low priority because you have to do all of the things in life that pay the bills and please your family and keep the roof over your head first before you have a hobby time. You know, I saw something, uh, somebody had written on the, on the whiteboard in my gym that self-care is not selfish. Mm. Yeah. We've and, talked about and, and that a number of times yeah, here. It, if you look at it as a hobby, then it becomes a selfish thing, right? So, you know, you know, it's, are you really going to use it? So to frame it another way in a, in a parallel context, are you really going to use your only day off to go play golf with your buddies and spend, instead of spending time with us? Mm -hmm. Are you really going to spend time to go on a fishing trip instead of taking the kids to Disneyland? 
right? So those that's how hobbies interfere with other things that you have to do. Mm -hmm. But if you look at fitness as a hobby, it's going to be the same way. And it's not. Right. The other way that people tend to look at fitness as a chore is mm -hmm. I got to go to, ugh, I got to get a workout in. I got to get, ugh, I guess I'm going to have to do it tonight. I guess I'm going to have to just wake up early tomorrow. I guess ugh, I, ugh, I am not feeling it. Uh, but I guess I'm just going to have to make myself go, you know, okay. Now it's an, uh, it's this terrible obligation. I wouldn't want to do that either. Mm -hmm. But if you have the warrior athlete mentality is I'm a warrior every day. I am preparing myself for battle. Now, and not, not against an enemy of any kind, but just, you know, I'm preparing my weapon, which is my body each and every day. And every day I'm going to be a 1% better version of myself than I was the day before or the week before. So if you look at it that way is each day I'm, I'm getting up and to be a better version of myself each and every day, you start to crave that time. Mm -hmm. You start to count down the hours in the day and you can't wait to get into the gym. And you, you, you look at what the, the workout that you have planned for the day and your palms start to get sweaty because you're just getting excited about what that's going to feel like and how much better that you're going to feel when it's over. And, uh, that, that's the way you just absolutely have to look at it, that, that you go in there every day and that's your mission. Your mission is to be a slightly better version of yourself each and every day through health. Mm -hmm. How do you, um, have you ever kind of thought about that as, and I'm, and I'm sure you have, but let, let's just rephrase that. I had to come to terms with that when I was running marathons and, and mm -hmm. it, you know, running marathons takes a lot of time there. You know, a lot of days you're just doing a three oh, yeah. mile run or a five mile run. That doesn't take a lot of time, but on Saturdays and Sundays, you're running like 20 miles as you're approaching the race. And that takes a lot mm -hmm. of time. And then there's a lot of recovery. And I really started thinking, you know, this is, this is kind of a selfish pursuit. And, and really mm -hmm. honestly at the time and with my mindset, it was kind of a selfish pursuit because I mm -hmm. had set a goal that I wanted to run a marathon and I wanted to run it in a certain time. And, you know, I was, I was working all the time and that's just what I needed to do. And yes, I did get up really early in the morning and do it. And I had the rest of the day for my, for my family, but I really had to come to terms with why is it that I'm really doing this? And what I came to terms with, with myself, that was, a was a complete game changer for my relationship with exercise and my relationship with fitness was that this is a responsibility for me to be in as good of possible, as good a shape possible so that I can be a better husband. I can be a better father. I can have more patience. I can be a better fishing guide because I have more patience and because I can stand up there and pull into the wind longer than I could, you know, last year. And when I started thinking like that, like I'm going to be the, I am the provider and I am the one that is responsible for this family. And I can't do my best job unless I am in my best condition. And that was, that was a game changer. Now, now what didn't change was I still realized that I can't do it at dinner, bath and bedtime. I can't do it, you know, when I should be with the family, I'm going right. to have to carve out time that's away from the family. And that meant four o'clock in the morning. That meant, you know, whatever it means to anyone on their personal side. Maybe you can do it when the kids go to bed, or maybe you can do it at lunch, or maybe your schedule allows for some other time. But you always say, like, you're not taking away time from the family. It doesn't become a, 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 a problem at home. It becomes a life enhancer. And, and I, I've found that a lot of, you know, just, just scheduling can make a huge difference for somebody that has a really busy schedule. Yeah. Schedule, scheduling is huge. And, and it also feeds into one of the, one of the, one of the exact point. You actually, you lob that up there for me to knock it out of the park. <laughs> it, it, it figures into there when I talk about how important it is to have a plan mm. and, and that, and having a plan, it means scheduling it means looking at realistically, um, how much time do I have during the week? Where, where is that time located? Is it early in the morning? Is it in the evening? Is it at lunch? Is it as soon as I get off work? So you need to plan that out. So just saying when, when people say, well, I'm going to, I got a gym membership. Okay. Well, what's your schedule? What do you mean schedule? Yeah. You got, you got to have, you need to have a, you need to have a schedule. You need to have a plan. Just having a gym membership. It's not some people think it's a magic talisman 
that having having uh, you know a power zone fitness card is just somehow going to transform them into better shape. And you have to have a comprehensive plan, and that starts it starts with goals and scheduling. I would say those are the two most important things right out of the gate and determining you know how you're going to carve that out because you don't want to this doesn't want to be at the exclusion of the rest of your life. You know, what's the point? I, I had a, I had a, a really good friend who worked out a lot and was in exceptionally good shape. You know, even he was a little bit younger than me, but even for how old he was, uh, he was in exceptionally good shape, but he never really took the time to stop and smell the roses. So, you know, it was kind of like, well, what are you working out for? Are you working out just because you want to spend three hours of your day working out every day, you know, where, where's the fun in that? Uh, uh, that's not living life. That's living in the gym. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you have a specific competition, you might be getting ready for, maybe that's important, but to do that at the, all your life at the exclusion of the rest of your life, that's not a good way to live. Um, also it's something you, you kind of sparked in my brain when you were talking about that is, is be, being healthy, it, it makes you a better husband, makes has a husband or wife, better father or mother. It also gives you the potential to be a healthier grandfather or grandmother, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Because you're going to have more longevity. Right. And also think of the example that you set for your kids. No doubt. Why, you know, when, when you go to a PTA meeting or you go to a, a sporting event and they see all of the parents who are 10 years younger than you and 35 pounds heavier and on two or three medications or wheeling an oxygen tank around with them everywhere they go. And gee, my mom and dad are in way better shape because they make it a priority. And the stuff that we eat at home is healthy. I've seen what these other kids, you know, they these kids got hot Cheetos in their, in their lunch bag every day. That's not what I get sent to school with. Right. So it's, it's about, you know, making generational change as well. And that's not a selfish thing. That's, that's good for them. Right. It does take a lot of work though, and dedication. And I saw sure. it firsthand um, just recently yeah. when I was on, on this trip with my kids, we were elk hunting and mm -hmm. um, it's incredibly physical. I don't know if you've ever been elk hunting, but you've certainly done plenty it's, of it's, it's other a, things. I hate to use the term bucket <clears throat> list, but it, I'll just say it's something that I want to do. <laughs> right. Well, it's uh, it, it's, it's an amazing thing. My son's been working at it for five years. It's, it's probably, I don't know. I, I'm not an expert at all types of hunting. I'm not a, probably not an expert at any types of hunting, but, um, it's, it's, I would say that it, 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 it would certainly be a strong argument for the most difficult thing to hunt in the lower 48. And the elk is a, it's a, it's a tough animal and it lives in very difficult places. And in order to get there, I mean, there's lots of ways you can elk hunt. You can do it on private land and you can do it with four wheelers and you can do it with you know, out, out of the truck. And there's lots of ways to kill one, but the way we chose to do it was public land getting way back in there where there, you, you can't take a four wheeler. So if you hike way back in there, the animal is less pressured, which is good, um, for getting close to them. But if you actually have any luck and you, you actually put one down, now you have to carry the thing out on your back. You can't bring, right. I mean, we, we didn't have horses. You could take horses in there, I guess, but you certainly can't take four wheelers in there. And here, I, I mean, I'm back there and I experienced this, this unbelievably incredible event with my son who has literally put the last five years of his life into this. Um, and, and he finally has success. Most of the, most of his last um, few years has been met with failure and frustration and, and, and just really looking like maybe this isn't ever going to happen. It's very difficult, mm -hmm. but thankfully I was able to be in good enough shape to do all of that with him and pack it out. And, and he looked at me and he was like, man, good job, dad. Like <laughs> that meant so much to me. I was just like, wow. Like, and I was hanging with him. And, yeah. and, you know, one of the things that I wanted to, to, to go, go through, I should have probably done this right away, but you didn't just write a book because you're a, a middle-aged guy that is in, in good shape. Like we went over your military background, the fact that you're a doctor, but what, what we didn't cover is the type of people that you're keeping up with, like a Tim Kennedy, like mm -hmm. the, you, you are able, you're three years older than me. Um, you said you graduated high school in 84. I graduated in 87. So 
I'm 53. You're 57. Is that right? 55, I'm 55. 55. So, yeah. Okay. So yeah, you're, turn, you're like my daughter that tomorrow. got out. Of, yeah. You said you got out in 17 at 17. She's, she was a, one of the youngest ones in her class too. I was one of the <laughs> older ones in my class, but anyway, we're, we're right in there and, and it would be very easy to, to kind of lose your edge. And that's what your book is all about, about keeping yeah. your edge after 40, but you have been able to do it to the extreme on the extreme edge of keeping up with our elite military at 48. Now you're still um, on the mat doing uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, mm-hmm. um, some Thai boxing, right? Mm-hmm. And yep. you're you're able to. I mean, I see you in the posts um, from Tim Kim, Tim. Tim Kennedy, that's easy to say. Um, Tim Kennedy, where he's posting the workout. It's a very in, intense workout. You're right there with him. You're in the mix. And you're 20 years older than everybody standing there. Um, yeah. That is why you have the credentials to write this book. All of those things. The fact that you're a doctor is is really interesting to me. Because somehow I've managed to stay in good shape. But it's mostly because I'm a meathead and I won't let injury... Um, derail me. I will do the work that it takes to get back to it where I think that a lot of people would throw their hands up and go, Oh man, I've got a, I've got a bad back. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if you do the work and you do the flexibility exercises and everything else, you can get back to being, you know, at 100%. But I just wanted to go over that before we went too much further, just so everybody kind of knows who you are and why, why you, have written this book. Um, did I leave anything out? <laughs> no, you know, you covered it, covered it very well. That's, uh, and it, it, that, that links really well into, you know, when, when I talk about, uh, you know, how important in, in, in one of the later chapters of the book, I talk about how important the tribe is. Mm. Yeah. That's and, one of my favorite chapters. And I definitely, let's, let's go into it right now because yeah, you know, I, I thought that that was, um, well, it, well, it's really important to me because I have a tribe. And it is, it is such an integral part of my fitness and of the sustainability of my fitness because I have this group of people. Let's talk about like a tribe as you describe it in your book. Yeah. So, um, and, and you mentioned Tim and, and Tim's a, a great example because obviously Tim is a physical specimen. I mean, he's a, you, you know, bet he is. Prof- he's a professional athlete, even in the, even in even in our community, even in the special forces community, Tim, Tim is an outlier, even in that. Even in you the know, UFC, he was an outlier. Yeah. Like he's, he's an he's, outlier of outliers. Yeah. He's in the top quartile, like everywhere he's going to go. Right. Cause that's just Tim. And, and that's all it's his mental drive, his work ethic, uh, and everything else. I, you know, I can't, I can't say enough good things about Tim, about what, a, what a good person he is, what a good friend he is, what a, what a great soldier and American that he is. But, um, that, you know, you see in those pictures, you know, on, on days that I'll go work, work out with Tim, that's, that's my tribe. My tribe isn't, you know, and, and I'm not knocking other guys my age and I have friends my age, but m- my tribe for the most part is guys who are performing at a high level. Um, most of which happen to be younger than me. And, and that's not because guys my age couldn't be doing it. It's for all the reasons we talked about before is, most of them have just decided not to, they've just decided that, you know, that's, that's not what's normal because, you know, the average guy my age isn't doing that. You know, he's, 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 he's got a motorcycle and a fat guy shirt, you know, and, and I had a motorcycle. Uh, I sold it not too long ago and, and I bought a fat guy shirt when I retired from the military. In fact, (laughs) if you, when Tim and I did hunting Hitler together, if you look at, uh, especially season three of hunting Hitler, I'd put on some weight, uh, because I was, you know, freshly retired and I was kind of, I was kind of shifting into that. I almost, I, I fell into that, that siren's call mm-hmm. of this is just what's expected of you. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to ride my Harley and smoke cigars on the weekends and cook out. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's just pretty much the way things are going to be. And, uh, the, the tribe is, is what can be really important in that because when, when you have motivation, you have discipline and, Sometimes you lose both of those. You know, I talk all the time about how discipline is more important than motivation because you won't always have motivation. So then you have to discipline yourself. Some days you don't have discipline either. And that's where somebody from the tribe reaching out and kicking you in the ass and saying, Hey, we're, 
we're at the gym. Why are you not here yet? You know, that, that becomes pretty important. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's Tim and Shane and, and all of my friends, we all, we all follow each other on a, on the, my zone fitness app and uh, not to give them a free plug. But, uh, if, if I don't log a workout in a few days, I start getting texts asking (laughs) me, are you injured? What's going on? You know, making sure, uh, that I, that I'm okay. But it was w- when I worked for a, uh, for sheepdog response, uh, for a while, I was their medical training director. And at one of the courses, I said this, and I ended up putting, putting this in the, in the book, basically quoting myself. I said, you know, if, if you look around and you figure out you're the toughest one of your friends, you need to find tougher friends. Yeah. I like that. And, uh, cause, cause you're not getting pushed, you know, and it's, it's, and this is even true for guys like Tim, because I, Tim isn't just content to, to always be the, he doesn't want to be the toughest guy in the training room. He wants to seek out those guys that are going to out grapple him or out strike him or outlift him or run faster than him, do more reps than him. He craves that competition. You know, he's, he's a great example. And I have no doubt that when he's, he's mining your age, he's going to be in exceptional shape just because he's going to continue to pursue that. Um, having a tribe, having, having those people that are going to support you, that when you need that little bit of external motivation, they're going to reach down and they're going to, they're going to make you run a little bit faster, make mm-hmm. you do one more set when you don't feel like it. Yeah. Uh, one one really, thing that really, really important. It is super important. And I don't want to interrupt you there, but I just want to, to just touch on this for a second, because part of what we're talking about here is like you're saying, you know, there's going to be somebody that tells you to do one more set and there's going to be tell you somebody that, that pulls you up and, and does all, all, you know, all of this support. We see it as support because that's a really pleasurable thing when somebody makes you do that. But for somebody that doesn't work out or hasn't worked out in five or six years, maybe the tribe is not exactly that to them. Maybe it's just that you, have an appointment at the park and you're supposed to meet someone. And if you don't show up there, you're letting that person down Mm -hmm. and your tribe is just accountability and your tribe is just, um, uh, fellowship. And Mm -hmm. it's not this drudgery that we spoke of before. It's Mm -hmm. now, Oh man, I'm going to get to do a run and I'm going to get to catch up with all my friends. And I'm going to have a little social time in the morning before I go to work. And, and this is my time and it's Mm -hmm. my time with my most trusted friends because you're bleeding together. You are out there. It's just no, no different than in the military where, where your, your training partners become your closest friends. It becomes family, right? Mm -hmm. And, that's what your training partners become. If you can find this tribe, let's talk about finding the tribe. How, would how, when somebody, when someone is, is making this transition, they're 45, they're tired of feeling sick and tired and they want to make this transition. They say, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to work out. I'm going to set my schedule. I'm going to do all of these things that we've talked about so far. And I need to find a tribe. Like what would your advice be for, for finding that tribe? So I think that the easiest way to kind of start that is because it's always a weird feeling, right? Walking into a gym, you know, you don't, you don't want to just go walking up to people blindly at the gym who are in there trying, you know, Hey, will you be in my tribe? You know, that, (laughs) that's a little weird, right? Leave. You might end up with a restraining order (laughs) doing something like that. So I, I think a great way to go about it initially is, uh, is for, is with an online tribe is Mm -hmm. take advantage of the fact that, you know, through social media, you know, I'm, I'm in, I'm in groups. I'm in, I'm in various Brazilian jujitsu groups online. People get, get a new stripe on their belt. They, they immediately take a picture and they post it in the group and everybody's lifting each other up. People have a question about an injury, about a technique. Everybody's lifting each other up and helping each other in that tribe. It's the same way, you know, if we own a Peloton bike in my house, there's, there's multiple online forums where Peloton users group together, my zone, uh, heart rate monitor users group together, lift, post their workouts, lift each other up. So that's a good way to start. And then you can start networking for who's kind of local to your area. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that I could maybe do some actual workouts in person with, um, but, but if you don't find that, you know, maybe, maybe you're in a remote area, 
you know, may, maybe you live on acreage somewhere in one of the Dakotas or something like that. You know, these, these online groups to me, there's a lot of toxic ones out there. I'll be honest with you, but there's a lot of really uplifting ones out there mm-hmm. too. And you can say, Hey, uh, so here's, here's a great example. So, uh, Dakota Meyer, uh, recipient of the yeah. Congressional Medal of Honor lives lives here in Austin. Dakota has a it's, it's called the Own the Dash group, mm-hmm. and they have fitness challenges going on in there with a plan, telling you exactly what to do. And people will post, "Hey, I you know what? I got five minutes into this workout and I had to quit." And they're 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 brutally honest about it. And people are saying, "Hey, pace yourself. Come at it from this angle next time. You can do this. I have confidence in you." So there are there are groups out there. You know, I think uh, what what Dakota is doing with Own the Dash, I think, is amazing. And I think that's a great example of a of a tribe you can network with that's gonna that's gonna lift you up and provide you that external motivation. And then over time, you just have to seek those people out. You know, mm-hmm. that's you know, you have the and you'll attract them to you as well. Yeah, you like will. as you're as you're interested in things and you go to a party and somebody's talking about something, maybe they start talking about something. Uh, you'll know that they're a CrossFitter if they can't shut up about CrossFit. Uh, yeah, or or, or a vegan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but you know that is a great way. That was actually how I got into um, CrossFit, um, and yeah. uh, you know it was back in 2008 or 2009. And I found an online, I was, I was running marathons and I decided I wanted to do something different. I found this Ross training. Do you know Ross Enamite? Um, no, he's a, you should really look him up. He's, he's a phenomenal resource. He's a boxer and a boxing trainer. And he had this, mm-hmm. he had this forum on his website and you could go on there and he would post all kinds of links, how to build your own equipment and different workouts and different things. And it was just a community. It was a, it was mm-hmm. a community. And I was in Key West and I was fishing all day and I didn't have anybody to work out with. And I just wanted something like you could do one of these workouts and it, it would, it was kind of like a CrossFit workout. There would be a time, then you could go post your time and your time is 15 minutes slower than some other guy's time. You're like, what in the world is going on? And then they're like, oh, well, you're, you know, you, what, what weight did you use? And all this, you know, you just have this community of people that kind of are, are uplifting. Mm-hmm. CrossFit had the same thing in the very early days. They would post the workout and there would be this comment section. There'd be three or 400 comments in there. Um, and, and there will be conversations going on within these comments and that has gone away. Um, mm-hmm. but there are different apps that you can log your different workouts in like beyond the whiteboard and there'll mm-hmm. be a comment section and people, and you can have, you can follow people and have friends. It's kind of like a little bit of social media, but that is, you know, Strava is another one that, that has kind of a similar, um, kind of community aspect, but that's, yeah. that's, that's a really good deal, um, about the online communities, because that that's another, um, excuse. Like I hear a lot of people, the, the number one excuse I hear for people not wanting to come work out with me is they say, man, I really want to come and join your group and be part of your group, but I got to get in shape first. Like, yeah, we, that's, that's the most common Brazilian jujitsu. I'm going to get in shape and then I'm going to start Brazilian jujitsu. Right. And where does that person end up in a year? Yeah. They're still saying that when they get in shape, they're going to start Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So what advice do you give to you give someone that's either, either saying, as soon as I find a group, I'm going to get in shape, or as soon as I get in shape, I'm going to start Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, or I'm going to start yeah. CrossFit, or I'm going to go to this other group that I heard about, or I'm going to join this, or I'm going to do whatever, but I got to get in a little bit of shape first. It'd be yeah. embarrassing to go in there right now. Yeah. I, I say, start now. And then, uh, you know, so we'll start with the the Brazilian jiu-jitsu excuse is Brazilian jiu-jitsu gets you in shape, Mm -hmm. number one. And I don't use it for my sole form of fitness. And I talk about that in the book, but you will be in better shape just from doing it. And and I tell them, you know what, you're actually going to be better at Brazilian jiu-jitsu in the long run if you start it when you're in poor shape. The reason being, if the guy who won, let's say the guy who won CrossFit games last year had never been to a, a, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu class and he took his first class tonight. He's actually not going to do too bad. As long as he knows some, has his wits about it. Mm-hmm. He's not going to gas. He's probably going to do fine in rounds. He's not going to feel terribly physically challenged. He might even sweep and get dominant position on quite a few people. 
you know, at, mm-hmm. at the, who are maybe blue belt level and below. Yeah. He's just a good athlete, you know, like, just because he's a good athlete. Right. right? It just, you know, and maybe you pull the football player off the wrestling, like you know, pull the football yeah. player into the wrestling room and oh, you got a couple of takedowns like, yeah, pretty good. And, you know, just on fitness alone, he's going to be able to gut it right. out a little bit. Right. But th- so a person who has, is not in good shape, who comes in there, they have to do the techniques properly. Or they're not going to get that payoff that, mm-hmm. hey, I'm doing pretty good. And I've seen people who started out their jujitsu journey in pretty good shape. And maybe they make it all the way up through the, you know, through say blue belt level. And then they start running into problems because they start going against better opponents and their sloppy technique that they were using strength or whatever for is just not quite working. I I watch I saw, watched somebody uh pop a bicep tendon mm. in class for just that reason. This was somebody who had uh, a lot of experience, had actually fought MMA before, but had not done a lot of formalized grappling training. So basically a, a kid that was just a really good fighter, mm-hmm. right? Had natural fighting ability, quick reflexes, very strong, um, was trying to muscle through a technique, popped his bicep, mm. right? Tough and, recovery. Uh, Right. And that was, that was because didn't have that. Okay. I'm forced to do proper technique early on. Right. And then for the people that say, well, I don't, uh, yeah, I want to start working out, but I need to find, I need to find a group first, or I need to find some people first. Hey, why don't, why don't you be patient zero in that group? You start working out and then, you know, maybe you're in the park alone doing burpees. And then people start coming up. Hey, I noticed you're, I noticed you're here every day in the park doing burpees. You know, what kind of workout are you doing? Mm-hmm. Would you mind if I came in and did this? Come group? on. Yeah. You, you end up being the Pied Piper. Right. That's how I started my group. All these That's exactly too. how I started my group. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we could talk about this all day, but I don't, I want to touch on a couple other things. You we're talking so much about getting back in shape. We're talking about, you know, making the commitment to work out. We're talking about time commitments and all of this. But in the book, you talk about the pillars of fitness and mm-hmm. the things that people could do even without working out that are going to improve their health. And I found that to be very interesting because it's a it's a place where I think that younger athletes don't put this as a I know I know myself, I never mm-hmm. put sleep as a priority. <laughs> I never right. put supplements as a priority. I never put even what I ate as a priority. You you even said it like you used to be able to just crush whatever and go run five miles yeah. and never think a thing of it. And as you get to our age, warm up is so much more critical. Sleep is critical. But can you go through the pillars as you as you do in the book? Yeah. So the, what I call the the pillars of fitness, which um, I probably should. And then I found out after I wrote the book that there's a bunch of people out there using the term pillars of fitness. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Some of them have four, some of them have six, like I do. Some of them have maybe as many as 10. Uh, But the the pillars of fitness that I talk about and, and other people will, it's a little bit more all encompassing in some other people's definitions. You know, when they talk about like nutrition being a pillar, Mm -hmm. when I talk about the pillars, I'm talking about specifically uh, when it comes to, to exercise. And I probably should have called them the pillars of exercise, but they're uh, strength and power, which are different because strength, strength is about how much weight you can lift. And power is really more about how fast you can lift it. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, I talk in there, you know, the, the, the comparison I always use is strength is what your squat max and your power is using those same muscles, getting behind a sled and somebody starts a stopwatch and you push it for 20 yards. So that's, that's what your power is, right? Endurance, which is pretty self-explanatory, right? That's you have muscular endurance, you have cardiovascular endurance. That's your ability to do sustained, sustained movement for a period of time. That's your endurance flexibility, which we're all familiar with because that's, that's your stretching, right? So that's your stretching of, you know, primarily your ligaments. So stretching your joints. So you depend on gravity and you depend on kind of pushing yourself against your joints to do flexibility, then mobility, which is a little, has more to do with muscles, fascia and tendons, because that's your ability to kind of move through some of the more difficult movements, but you're doing it 
under your own power. And the, the example I give in the book, which I still yeah. think is probably the best example is, you know, Bruce Lee, you've all seen pictures of him. He can bend over, touch his forehead to his knees. That is his flexibility. You've probably also seen that he could kick up over his head and kick a target directly over his head. That's his mobility doing that because gravity is not doing it. It's not passive. It's active. Right. And then uh, the final thing that I talk about that's probably the most important for, for us as we get older is durability. Mm -hmm. And durability is all of the neglected muscles apart from the prime movers. So we all know biceps, triceps, pectoralis, gluteus. We know all of those. There's a lot of little unnamed muscles there that we neglect. And those are important because that's what makes us durable. That's what stabilizes our joints when we're going through these other movements. That's what keeps us from getting injured. So the durability aspect of it, which primarily starts with your core, but, but extends really to your entire body, is, is a very important and very often neglected and I, I've seen it neglected even by people who I would consider to be in really, really good shape, mm -hmm. even at an advanced age, because they still maybe only want to do deadlift, squats, military press, bench press. You know, they want to they want to do the, the, the classic six or so exercises. They're not doing single limb exercises. They're not doing uh, they're not doing things that maybe are a little bit different, like Turkish get ups and things mm -hmm. of that nature. And I do think that that CrossFit lends itself very well to all of those pillars, especially the durability aspect mm -hmm. of it, as long as you're doing things slow and controlled and durability has to come. You're not going to get advances in strength and power and maintain them unless you're looking at the durability and really the mobility and the flexibility as well. So you have to work all of those things in conjunction. So on your own personal um, program, you know, Brazilian mm -hmm. Jiu-Jitsu has a lot of mobility and flexibility yeah. in involved in it. And I'm sure that you're stretching uh, extensively before and after your class. Um, but what, what, what are you doing um, otherwise for your mobility and flexibility? Yeah. So, uh, I have to do a lot of stuff on my own and it over, I, I can tell you in you know, full disclosure and all honesty, the last couple months have been terrible for me, flexibility wise. And it's just ended up that schedule, the book came out and uh, that has kind of ended up being the place in my workouts that that's tending to get cut a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I haven't done yoga in a few months. Yoga is to me is just absolutely probably the best thing out there for both flexibility and, mo and mobility, um, because it puts you in positions that you wouldn't otherwise choose to be in. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you will not typically find yourself in, uh, just in the gym, whether you're doing, you know, traditional type, uh, strength and, and fitness training, or whether you're doing even something as advanced as CrossFit. So I think yoga is really instrumental for that. And I think it's, it's something I, I was first introduced to yoga when I decided to do P90X and of mm. course P90X had an, an hour and a half, uh, right. yoga workout, yeah. which, which I think is a bit long. <laughs> yeah. That, that is a great yoga workout, but an hour and a half of yoga is a long time. Um, I, I enjoy doing yoga. I, I enjoy all types of yoga, but I, it, it really does. You start to really identify things that you can and can't do, and mm -hmm. they might seem in, insignificant, but you have to realize when it comes to functional fitness, when it comes to, you know, I may have to pick up something at a really odd angle mm -hmm. on uneven ground. Right. That's when those things are really going to come into play. Yeah, And that's know, where, it, that's where like the listeners of this podcast, like fishermen and hunters picking, <clears throat> excuse me, picking a trailer tongue up and in the, in the dark yeah. of the morning and mm -hmm. putting it on the trailer hitch is yeah. a recipe for serious injury on and, golf ball size gravel. Right. Yeah. It angle. happens all the time, yeah. all the time. And P or picking up a cooler or a cast net or any of these things. And that's where it becomes so important. Have you <laughs> ever, have you ever heard of, um, Joe hip and steel? No, I haven't, man. I would love for you to look this guy up. Um, I injured my back last Christmas Badly. And I, it's been chronic throughout the last 20 years that, you know, I, I've, I've wrestled for a long time and just 
I don't know. There's something going on back there. And mm-hmm. then with all the, the lifting and everything else, it would just happen occasionally. Well, I kept thinking, you know what? I think it's because I'm inflexible. I think I'm losing my flexibility. Never that I used to do Taekwondo and I was probably when, when I was the most flexible and we would have an hour and a half class and 45 minutes of the class was stretching. And yeah. that helped my wrestling so much because I was doing them at the same time. And I was going in the wrestling room and my coach was like, wow, like you are moving way better. Well, it was all because of all that stretching. And I've always thought about that. And as I've gotten older, I've thought, I think I'm getting less flexible. Like it's not just really apparent, but mm-hmm. it could be three or four inches that I could bend over a little for, you know, an inch or two further. Well, mm-hmm. that is a recipe for for disaster as you move bigger and bigger weights. And so I I hurt my back and I was like, you know what? I'm going to find a program that I can do on my own and I'm going to dedicate myself to it and I'm going to become much more flexible. I'm going to regain my flexibility. And it could be yoga. I used to get on um, uh, Amazon Prime. They have tons of yoga up there, like hundreds of different yoga things up there. And I would do those yoga classes and it was very helpful. But I found this guy, Joe Hippensteel, Ultimate Human Performance. And he's in he's in uh, San Diego and he works with the Navy SEALs there. And he has uh, he was actually mentioned in David Goggins book uh, and helped him with his inflexibility problems. Mm -hmm. And man, I started his program and I I feel like a million bucks. He he told me it was going to be like winding the clock back. And he is absolutely right. It's very similar to a lot of yoga, except there's mm-hmm. standards. You are like, he's like, you're going to be sitting cross-legged and, you know, in Indian style, and you should be able to put your head on the ground. And if you can't put your head on the ground, you have a problem and you need mm-hmm. to continue working on that position until you can get further and further and further down. So every position has a standard, what the human body should be able to do. And when I first started this, I couldn't get close to any standard. And the closer I've gotten to all of these different standards, the better I'm moving, the better I'm feeling, and the less injuries I've had. I have had zero injuries except for developing um, patellar tendonitis and For that, I was using his program, and I also started to look at this knees over toes guy. um, Which have you? Do you know who he is on Instagram? No, uh knees over toes guy. He his name is Ben Patrick. He's got a really incredible story. He's helping thousands and thousands of people with their knees, and uh, you should check him out. I think that oh, I know. Just in our conversation here, you're going to be like, wow, like that's really cool what he's doing. And um, a lot of it's contrary to what we've always heard. Like when you're squatting, you shouldn't get your knees over your toes. And that's what his whole thing is, is like, no, that's what's missing. You're not training your tibs at all. And you're getting, you're, you're, you're having all these weaknesses and you're having all these inflexibility issues. And I don't know, it's just amazing. I would love for you to look at it and, and hear yeah, what you thought about it, it. Both of those guys. Um, Joe Hippensteel is not on social media like Ben Patrick. Ben Patrick is a social media powerhouse. You'll find him okay. immediately and he's posting videos every single day. Um, I'll check him out. But anybody that's got any kind of issues with their knees, man, that is he he is amazing. But anyway, I was just kind of wondering what you did. It's funny though, how like the first thing that tends to go is the flexibility work because it is the least for, for lack of a better term, it's the least sexy thing about yeah. fitness, like <laughs> sitting there and stretching for an hour. Like, yeah, that's pretty boring, you know, but that it's the, as I age, I'm like, I don't need more deadlifts right now. I need more flexibility. I need more mobility. I don't need more snatches. I don't need more muscle ups. I can do all those things. But in order to do more of those things at all, I have to spend the time on the mobility and the flexibility. Like you say, though, it's not, it's not sexy and it's, it's hard. It's like, it's like, it's like sitting in a duck blind you know, for, <laughs> for a long period of time, right? You, you're, you're bored. Yeah. It's, you know, stretching, stretching is pretty boring. 
It's, uh, you know, even, even with the, with the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the sitar music playing in the right. background, <laughs> it's, it, it's hard to, to keep your mind on that. And, you know, it's, and that, that was the thing I, I said, you know, I did, you know, the 90 minute P90X, you know, yoga X mm-hmm. start, start looking at the clock. Like, how, right. much, how much, how much more do I have of this? You know, to, to me, 45 minutes, 45 minutes to an hour of, 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 of yoga, especially is kind of about what I can tolerate. Um, but it, it's hard because it's, it, it's the same. It's the, the mentality of getting people to understand how important sleep is, is the same mentality that carries over into that. It's like, well, I feel like I'm not doing anything. I mm-hmm. feel like I, I'm just, I feel like I'm just waiting to where I can actually go do something. And, right. and, and you have to, you have to flip that switch and look at it differently. Mm-hmm. Um, the guys that I know that do, that do yoga two to three times a, a week are by far the healthiest. Mm. Interesting. You know, they really are for that reason. You know, yeah. their, their durability, their mobility, and their flexibility is all just, just really, really good. And I try not to, I, for the most part, my, my, my flexibility and my mobility is good. I'm having some, some issues with my right hip that, uh, probably in about five years are going to actually require surgery. Mm. Um, and it, it's hard for me to get around those. And, but it's, it's dangerous when you do these workarounds too, because anytime you're losing flexibility and mobility in one joint, your kinetic chain makes that up in the adjacent joints, which mm-hmm. means you're overstressing that. So I, so I'm fully prepared to start having more right knee problems to have some problems in my lower back because of the compensation that I'm doing, uh, in my hip. Maybe so not I'm, though. I'm trying Maybe when What's you that? find Joe hip and steel in this knees over toes guy, yeah. you might not, man, I'm telling you, it's, I, yeah, I hope it's so. remarkable. That, that, that would be great. You know, it's, uh, my, my last imaging on my right hip was, was not good. You never want to hear the terms bone on bone. You're right. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, when, when stretching and yoga and, and mobility is not boring is when you are having trouble doing a mundane task like going up and down the stairs or mm-hmm. getting off the toilet or getting up out of the uh, out of the couch because yeah. your knees hurt or your hips hurt and you stretch for about 2 weeks and you're like, "Huh. I don't hurt anymore." Yeah. That's when it's that's when you kind of are like, "Okay, I see this is actually making a difference in my everyday life and I'm yeah. moving better. And now I can go and do the things that I want to do, whether that's golf or tennis or pickleball or, or, or working out or climbing yeah. mountains or whatever it is. And that's when, that's when I see that it's, it's, it, it becomes a real important part of the whole program. But I didn't realize yeah. that until I was 50 probably. Yeah. You know, it, it, re- it really does. You know, it's a, you know, it's a basic movement that, uh, when, when I was doing my internal medicine rotation, uh, at my intern year, the, uh, the internal medicine attending, uh, that I was working under, uh, was also a geriatrician. So she specialized in, in older patients, right? She'd done a, a fellowship in geriatrics and a test that she would have all patients do, which I thought was pretty interesting was what's called the get up and go test. Hmm. And you, you sit them either on a bed, you can do it on a hospital bed or in a chair and you just feet planted on the ground, put your, put your hands in front of you. So you don't get to put your hands on your legs, on your thighs or on the chair or bed and move to a standing position. Right. And you should be able to do that without swinging to get momentum, without having to push off of something. And it, it's, it's a little bit of a tri- tricky movement. Cause if you think about it, even with squatting, you're a little bit farther back than you are with squatting, right? Mm-hmm. You're not, you're not in that good body position you would typically be. So, and she said, that's one of the first things that, that tends to go in people. And if, if they're still maintaining that, she said, I can tell by a get up and go test if, if they're otherwise active, you know, if they're lying to me about, Oh, I, you know, I go for a walk every day and I do this and I do that. She said, if they, I can tell by their get up and go test, if they're, if they're being truthful with me or not, and if they really are doing some type of exercise program. And, uh, that's such a, that's such a small thing, but, you know, I would say to people, if you notice in the morning, when you get out of bed or every time, or when you get off, you know, we always say, use the term, get off the couch, right? Well, when you do get off the couch, if you have to aid yourself to do that, then 
you got to, you got a ways to go <laughs> and, and you need to start looking at, at things like what you're talking about to, to get yourself there. Mm -hmm. Or, or yoga, anything really. Yeah, anything. I mean, there are some things that are probably better for some people than others, but mm -hmm. just doing something is better than doing nothing. And even if it's just stretching a little bit, but I mean, there's so many free things like mm -hmm. most people have Amazon prime. I, I, if you just type in yoga on Amazon Prime, there are mm -hmm. literally hundreds of DVDs available that you can watch it at, mm -hmm. you know, for free. And yeah, there's this Julia Jarvis. She's a really good one that I've, I, I really like her. She's, I can barely do any of the things that she can do, but she's, she's, she's a good one to follow. And, and, um, I don't know, that's really good. But since I found hip and steel, that one is, uh, he, he is, he's legit. That's great. Um, what about, uh, supplements before we go? Um, you're, what do you, you, you have a, you have a very aggressive supplement routine that you list in the book, mm -hmm. but you know, in the age of COVID and one of the things that, that Joe Rogan talks about so much that I agree with him so mm -hmm. much on is that we don't hear anything about strengthening the immune system. Very little of what we're hearing about um, anything associated with COVID is vaccine related. It's not mm -hmm. like take matters into your own hands and strengthen your own immune system by things that you can do, supplements that you can take, habits that you can have. Mm -hmm. What what do you think are the are the supplements that we we should all be taking as we get over the age of 40 um and and i mean you can go into your entire supplement routine if you want but it's it's it it's a lot like those that's yeah. probably a lot of pills you, <laughs> you take but yeah, I, I take would, a lot of pills know, i take a lot of vitamins too i i would sum it up you know it's you know i i outline them all in in that in my supplement chapter but i think what i talk about for longevity and and that was the reason that when i launched my own supplement line that was the first one that i put out there the longevity because, one yeah the longevity formula uh -huh. because and you have two formulas right you have yeah, longevity I, and energy and energy okay. are out right now and uh I, I always felt that longevity was, was the most important and what everybody needed the most. The reason I released energy formula at the same time was everybody that I was talking to, or not everybody I was talking to, but a number of people that I was talking to kept saying, oh, people are going to want energy, 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 energy. That's the big thing that everybody's going to want energy. People love energy formulas. They love pre-workouts. And, and I, and they said, oh, you're going to find out that that one just outsells longevity. And sure enough, when I released them both longevity outsells energy at twice the pace. And I don't, I don't push, I hate marketing, so I don't push marketing for either. It's just, you know, I, I'm, I do a couple of videos and a couple of posts here and there being very honest and forthright about what is in them and what, why I put them in there, what the clinical data shows and people make their own decision. But sure enough, exactly as I anticipated, because that was the, the supplement that was most important to me. So uh, talking about the things that are in it and, and, and I know Joe Rogan would agree with this, uh, Vitamin D3, almost mm -hmm. everybody is vitamin D deficient. Now we don't, we don't, nobody's drinking milk anymore. Mm -hmm. We're, we don't get the amount of sunlight, you know, I mean, I'm sure you do, but most people well, probably well, don't. Well, maybe, but even, even people that are in, in, um, Southern climates, you know, you're, you, you've been so, so brainwashed that you're going to get skin cancer in 10 minutes if you're outside without, without right. sunscreen on that, um, yeah. you know, and I'm not sure you could tell us a lot better. And I would be very interested in your opinion of how sunscreen affects the body's ability to pr pr produce or process, uh, vitamin D from the sun. Mm -hmm. But I would imagine that it, it diminishes it greatly. And then like I, what we do is we wear clothes. Like, yeah. Yeah, like I don't put sunscreen on. I don't wear sunscreen. I think it's gross and it tastes bad in your mouth. And I think that using that stuff every single day cannot possibly be good for you. I'm not advocating that anyone else do this. I'm just saying if you're out in the sun for 300 days a year and you're caking that stuff on, I don't see how that could be good for you. So I use clothes. I cover up all the way up to the, my sunglasses. I wear a hat, wear a long sleeve shirt. I usually wear pants. If I'm going to be out there for a long time, I started wearing shorts like on the show, but, um, covered up, you know, and I don't, I don't think you're producing vitamin D like you are. If you, if you have your shirt off or something. 
No, you're, you're not. And it's, you know, it's, uh, somewhere in there is the happy medium, right. That mm-hmm. we can get, you know, the right amount of sunlight that we're activating enough vitamin D and, and not running the risk of skin cancer, but it's skin cancer is, is so common. And, uh, you know, if, if you're spending any amount of time in the sun at all, it's skin cancer, unfortunately, is one of those cancers. That it's it's almost I talk about in the book about how the longer you live, you do reach a point that if you're a male, it's almost a certainty that you're going to get prostate cancer just mm-hmm. because it's it's so common. It, it's almost to that point with with skin cancer. And that's why I think, uh, like you said, I, I much prefer to wear UV blocking clothing as opposed to caking on sunscreen. I'm a ginger so, you know, I'm really prone to sunburns. It's something I do have to think about when mm-hmm. I, you know, at a range, going out for a range day, going out on my mountain bike, whatever it might be. I have to think about that. And I prefer to wear, hold, hold on one second. I got a little bulldog emergency here. <laughs> Neil. <Yeah>. Sorry. <laughs> he's a, uh, my bulldog wandered in and he's decided that this is his toy. Well, I've got a lab that's about to wander in any minute, so it'll be fine. All right. I need you to be good. Okay. I need you to be good. Um, sorry about that. So it, it, it's important. It is important to cover up. And I think rather than, than caking on sunscreen, I do think clothes is a better way to approach it. And I also think, you know, let yourself get some sun and do regular skin cancer screenings, because guess what? It's skin cancer is common, but if you find it early, you know, they take that lesion off and you're good to go. So let yourself get some sun, you know, go, you know, go out, whether you, you know, do an archery or, or hunting or mountain biking or golf or going to the beach and get those regular sun cancer screenings, get them every year, get a, a full skin survey every year. And if there is a concerning lesion, you catch it early mm-hmm. and, and then you don't have to worry about it. Right. So that, that's one thing because, because we are, we're, we're just not getting the vitamin D that, that we used to have. And I, I'm vitamin D deficient, according to my labs. I'm, I would, I would venture to say that most people probably how, are. How much do you suggest, age. um, on the IU? How much do you suggest? <sighs> yeah, it's, um, so depending on who you talk to, you're going to get, you're going to get various, uh, various opinions on, on that. Right. Um, it's, and, and I don't, uh, I don't have it in front of me. I could actually punch it up if I, if I needed to, um, 5,000 IU is a number that gets kicked around quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the problem is, and this is what I found out when I just started to, to, to make my own supplements is it's really difficult to tell it. Not all I use are created equally, unfortunately is sometimes the, the, the IUs aren't necessarily what's necessarily what's bioavailable. Uh, sometimes a company you, you might be buying, it might not even list it by IUs. It might list it in a different format. Mm -hmm. So it it can get a little bit confusing. Um, I give some specifics in my book and I have some, some specifics that I have in my supplements. Hold on. I'm going to actually open a document here because I want to see if I can find this. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, I always tell people, you know, what I recommend probably more than anything is it, as opposed, I, I like to give guidelines, but as opposed to just taking my word for it, ask your doctor. Cause I, I, I want you to take what's in my book and then I want you to go to your own doctor with that. Mm-hmm. And I and want look at you your to get blood their work, opinion on it. Right. And, and, and also look at your blood work. Yeah. Cause you, cause you might not, maybe you're not vitamin D deficient. Now you can still, it's still a good idea to supplement that to some extent, but when we're talking about certain vitamins, so vitamins A, D, E, and K, you can get too much of, because those are the fat soluble vitamins. When we're talking about the water soluble vitamins, you're just going to, you know, that's, that's why your urine gets nice and bright yellow, right? Mm-hmm. When you take a lot of vitamins because you're just, you're just peeing that stuff out. Now, let me um, ask you this though. Yeah. Your body produces vitamin D. Like if, yes. if you're in, if you're in Miami, someplace low, low, close, closer to the equator, 
and you mm-hmm. go for, I mean, I've read this before. I don't, I don't know if it's correct or not, but if you go shirtless for 30 minutes in the middle of the day in Miami, um, mm-hmm. in the summertime, you're likely to produce 20,000 IU, your body, right. the way that your body produces it naturally. Now, mm-hmm. is that being stored in the fat that when, when, when your body produces it naturally like that, just purely mm-hmm. through the sun, not supplementing, is that mm-hmm. being stored? Could you get too much vitamin D that way? It's, it's virtually impossible, I think, to get too much vitamin D that way because you're going to get to a point. Uh, n- number one, you're using so much of that for cellular metabolism and mm-hmm. for, for repair uh, and for cellular function. Um, it's really unlikely that you're going to get I don't know of any cases where anybody got vitamin D toxic, yeah. you know, just, you get just because they were out in the sun all the time. You get yeah, super get sunburned, sunburned, but then, yeah, but get- you could get t- vitamin D toxicity by taking too much in the supplement form. Yes. Okay. By taking exogenous vitamin D, you could actually absolutely get too much vitamin D. Okay. Yeah. And that's why I recommend if it, in the, the supplements that I sell, uh, that I formulated, it's, it, it's 2000. Uh, it's 2000 and 2000 split over two doses. So one in the morning and one at night, 5,000 is a good ballpark figure kind of for a day. That's, that's what a lot of the guidelines recommend. Um, I, I like 2000 and 2000 because my assumption is everybody's going to get at least some, even if you're not having an eye towards vitamin D rich foods, you are getting some vitamin D mm. through and, the food. And I don't believe through food. a lot of these supplement brands that are out there, you'll see them just absolutely shotgunning 5,000 times the recommended daily allowance. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what is this, you know, it, is that a person that you're just assuming is, is eating Cheetos for all their meals? I mean, right. you know, and not me, going outside at all. Right. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. How, how important do you think it is that like you, you suggest that you take in a morning dose and a night dose. Like when you when you have 5,000 times the amount of vitamins and you take this pack of vitamins in the morning, like mm-hmm. how important would that be? Would it be better to spread that out into two doses or would, would, does it matter? Is your body just going to take those vitamins and use them as it needs and get rid of the rest? Mm-hmm. Or would it be better to, to do two doses? No, with, with most vitamins, it is in my opinion, uh, better to do it in, in split up doses. And the reason is, exa- you know, exactly what I illustrated before you notice you take that big vitamin pack in the morning mm-hmm. and then your urine looks right. like, looks like a silent stick <laughs> right. up until about two and then it doesn't anymore. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's, you just wasted all that. That was stuff that you didn't need because maybe you got a 24 hour, you got the 24 hour recommended daily allowance, but you got it all at once. Right. And your body just cannot sort it out in that time frame, Right. It's just, it just became overloaded. It said, Hey, we've got too much. We can't, we cannot process at this rate. So we're just going to dump some off. Um, vitamin D, especially because of it, the way that it has to do with bone health as well, your bone remodeling, since it takes place at night, it's good to have some vitamin D at night, mm. right. To have that ready supply. So I like, that's why I like to split it up some in the morning because I, I probably used some over the overnight. So I'm a depleted B I'm going to need some for cellular function and cellular repair during the day. And now I do it again at night. So I've preloaded with substrate. So as my body goes right back into that cycle again, during sleep, Mm -hmm. it's got vitamin D available. Interesting. What about calcium and magnesium in that? Because like, as you're, as you're working out and you're stretching and Mm -hmm. it's one of the things that Joe Hippensteel talks about is that especially magnesium uh, I think yeah, magnesium and calcium both, but he's like, those are the building blocks for you to like, when you, when you are tearing down your muscle and that's what you're doing when you're stretching, you're, you're breaking it just slightly. And then in order to, for that to recover, it's one of the things that he's, he's suggesting is, is that you definitely supplement with magnesium and calcium. And, yeah. and would that be better like post stretching or would that be better at night? Uh, I, again, that's one of those things that I, I tend to like it both Mm. calcium. I will lean towards if I had to put more importance on it, I'll put more importance on it in the evening. I tend to also supplement magnesium in the evening. And that is because not, not because you might not be using it all day, but because one of the benefits of magnesium is it relaxes smooth muscle. 
it uh, it increases a lot of the circulation, especially to your brain. It opens up the terminal airways in your lungs. Mm. And because of the relaxation effect of magnesium, it's a great natural sleep aid. Mm. So I like to load all of my magnesium at night. And that's why I don't, you'll see, I don't, neither longevity nor energy formula has magnesium down the road when I, my sleep formula comes out and, and I talk about, you know, currently I, I piecemeal that formulation together, mm-hmm. but before I go to bed, I take magnesium. Mm-hmm. So magnesium is probably one of the most underappreciated things that you can take uh, for sleep, for respiratory health, for muscle relaxation, muscle repair. Uh, it's, it, I use it to treat migraine headaches. I use <laughs> it to treat asthma attacks in the emergency room. Um, really yeah. asthma attacks asthma attack yeah that's uh, iv magnesium it's i have i have saved patients from going to the icu with iv magnesium because mm-hmm. it's just such a great thing and the great thing about magnesium is as long as your kidneys are are functioning uh it's really difficult it's not impossible to give somebody too much magnesium um but doing it orally or getting magnesium toxicity, what we call in the wild Mm -hmm. is virtually impossible. The only time we typically medically see magnesium toxicity is what we, in what we call eclampsia patients. So these are uh, either women who they used to call it toxic toxemia of pregnancy, and we have to give them magnesium and we have to monitor their respiratory rate, their urine output, and their reflexes. Because the first indicator that you've given somebody too much magnesium and that their body's not eliminating it is their reflexes start to become dulled. Hmm. That, that's your indicator that, okay, they've got too much magnesium. Wow. But this is patients that are getting IV magnesium right. as a drip over time. So would, would magnesium possibly be a, a, a benefit for someone that has asthma just as a, as a, on a daily basis? supplement like that they should be taking magnesium uh that's i would defer to their pulmonologist for de, for de, for definitive guidance on that mm-hmm. but there's really no reason that, that i can think that it wouldn't be <laughs> and there, and there's certainly not going to be a harm in it and i think everybody should take it as a sleep aid right interesting so <clears throat> we've gotten into the weeds a little bit talking about whether we take it in the morning or take it at night um so everybody should be supplementing with vitamin d yeah. Is your opinion. But, and then but vitamin D, vitamin C, uh-huh. zinc, which most people don't even, I mean, everybody knows what zinc is, but don't realize how important it is. So your collagen cross-linking, uh, all of your soft tissue repair is dependent on zinc. It was, it, it took a surgery rotation as a med student for me to fully appreciate how important zinc is. And, you know, the fact that when you see people that have stretch marks, that's because of a zinc deficiency. Really? Uh, because they're, yeah, because they're, they're, they were basically stretching and their body couldn't keep up with it to repair it. Wow. So those are like, those are like little tears that you see. Because I always thought that was because you it. just grew too fast. Like you would see that like with linemen and like, like big guys, right. heavyweights. Right yeah, yeah. You'd see it yeah, and, right, and right along their, their, their obliques where mm-hmm. it just, and, and, and knowing those people, it's like, well, yeah, you grew like nine inches in a year one time and put on a yeah. hundred pounds. Um, yeah. I guess your body couldn't keep up with it, but a zinc deficiency, I never, that never crossed my mind. Yeah. That's it's cause you notice not, not all of those guys. So you, so you have, you have two guys that might've grown at similar rates. Right. They didn't, they didn't both get stretch marks. Right. You have, you know, uh, not all, not all women get stretch marks during pregnancy, but right. some do. Right. So, you know, zinc is, is basically the key to eliminating that and, and zinc, zinc supplementation. And it's, it's in, that's, that's why it's in all of these, uh, cold and flu formulations mm-hmm. that you see that people, you know, you, Oh, you're, st- you're starting to feel a little bit of a cold coming on. You're going to take vitamin C and you're going to take zinc because your, your tissue repair and your, and your immune response is, is really dependent on, on vitamin C, vitamin D3 and zinc. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think those, those are, if I was giving an elevator spiel on doc, what should I take? That that would be it. I mean, to me, that's the that's the cornerstone right there. Now, is that your longevity formula? That's in a nutshell. That with turmeric and bioprin are my longevity formula. So I mean, I instead do, of taking all these different pills, they can just get your your longevity formula. Yes. Okay. How do you yeah. do that? Where do you get it? You go to graybeardperformance.com and uh, you click on supplements. Again, I have two in the line now: the longevity formula and the uh, energy formula. And, uh, I should have vitality formula coming out in probably the next four months. Huh. 
And then eventually all, everything that you see in the supplement chapter eventually will be available on that website. So what if you're 30? Are you not supposed to take your gray beard formula you if can, you have a black beard? Absolutely take all. If you have a black beard, a brown beard, a red beard, uh, yeah, a red beard, whatever it might be, you can actually take all that stuff. And that's I have there are there are women taking my supplements as well. So mm-hmm. I've gotten emails from a couple of different women who said they've taken they checked they took my supplements that their husband was taking, took a bottle to their doctor and said, "Is there any reason that I shouldn't be taking this?" And their doctor said, "No." As a matter of fact, it would be beneficial. Mm-hmm. And that's two different women have emailed me saying they're taking longevity formula and they feel great. Well, I think that you know, it, just speaking of my own personal experience, when I start researching vitamins and I'm like, oh yeah, I should be doing D and now C and, and magnesium and calcium and all of this. And next thing I know, I've got a tackle box full of vitamins and mm-hmm. I really become like, and, and I can't really feel them working. Like mm-hmm. I can't, it's not like I drink a cup of coffee and I'm like, wow, okay. I, mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel that. There's there's a reason that coffee and caffeine is like the number one beverage in the world because you feel it like that. When mm-hmm. you're taking these vitamins, a lot of times you can't feel the difference right away. And, and maybe it's a real slight difference. And over time, it's going to make a big difference. But right mm-hmm. away, you're not feeling it. And I get fatigued of of just taking 12, 15 vitamins. And if I just had a pack or if I had one or two vitamins or whatever, and I just knew I'm getting everything I need out of this one, I think a lot more people would take vitamins just, just of, of just saying this, just make it simple. Like just take two of these in the morning, two of these at night and you're good to go. Yeah. That's, uh, I'm hoping that, you know, my, my overall goal and, and a lot of supplement companies do this, right. They have the little envelope, you know, mm-hmm. it's a, it's right. a, yeah, maybe a morning envelope and an evening envelope. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping that eventually I can get to that point that, uh, that I've kind of grown the company to a point that I can do that, that mm-hmm. it's just going to be an envelope that you take, you know, you have a, a day pack and a night pack and, and you take those or take them as you need them. That that's my long-term goal. I wish I could do it in just one, you know, like, uh, ideally it would be like a chewable pill that you could just take, but it's, mm-hmm. it's really difficult to get, uh, everything that you need in that. And I also, I also kind of feel like not everybody needs everything. Like, you know, some people might not, they, they might say, I I don't need any type of energy formula. You know, I I like just drinking a cup of coffee before a workout. Um, so I like for people to have a little bit of uh, autonomy when it comes to choosing what they take and what they don't take. Right. And is it possible to get everything you need from food these days? It's, it's not possible. Well, so about every 10 years, they redo the study and they say, yeah, you don't need to take vitamins. You can get everything you need from food. Mm. But here's the problem with that is they, they don't base it on what most people are actually eating. Number one, Mm -hmm. and, and supplements is not an excuse to eat like crap, right? You, You do need to have a good cornerstone of diet, but the other problem is, is they're not, they're not, they're usually looking at average again, averages. They're not looking at people that want to be high performers. So if, if they, you, you and I, you know, and just, and, and just, just from knowing what I know about you and looking at your social media, you are an outlier at 53 years old, just like I'm an outlier at 55 mm-hmm. years old, right? Mm-hmm. The, the average in our age group activity level wise and what they're doing and strength and fitness wise is, is below us, Right. And it's not because we're superhuman. It's because, you know, we're, we're doing the right things, but that also means that the demand on our bodies and on our, uh, on our, uh, on our cellular metabolism is greater. Mm -hmm. So we need a little bit of a boost when it comes to healing, which is why C D three zinc, all, all these things are important. We're working out more. So we need things like turmeric, uh, to, to kind of head off that inflammation before it occurs. So we don't have to take 800 milligrams of ibuprofen Mm -hmm. midway through the afternoon because, Oh my God, I'm just not, not feeling like I'm going to make it. If I don't take something, (laughs) we, we need all these things because we're at a higher level of activity and that's not typically what they're looking at. They were, they're looking at average people eating what for the most part can be considered a good balanced diet. And then asking them some pretty generic questions about their energy level. They're not checking specific metrics. In most of those studies, there's not a lot of objective data to show 
uh, okay, this is where people were on their run times, their VO2 right. max, right. The, uh, how, much, how much they were able to lift. That's not the things they're looking at. That's why when you look at the, and they're also looking at it as kind of a blanket statement too. They're looking at vitamins as a family. Mm-hmm. And that's why what I did when I decided what I was going to take is I would look at an individual thing like D3, like turmeric. And then I would go into PubMed and I would start pulling articles and say, what is the clinical data on this? Okay, here's here's a study where they gave this group a placebo and they gave this group D3. And this is what they found. Their lab levels were correct. Not only did they have something measurable that they could say it was definitely making an impact, but also they had subjective stuff along along with that. They said they felt better. They said their recovery time was better. They had a better feeling of overall health and they were more active. Hmm. So you can't look at it in the aggregate, which is what most of these studies do. You have to look at it as individual things. And that's most people just frankly don't have the time to do that. Right. I know they don't have the time to do it. And then they just kind of like, well, then I'm just not going to do it at all. Whereas it might even be better just to take up any kind of a multivitamin, like anything like might be better. But then if you can get a high quality one, like probably yours, um, you know, you're good to go. Like that's all you need. Uh, Honestly, when, when I would, when I would deploy, you know, I, I had the, 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 the line of bottles, uh, on the kitchen counter at home, mm-hmm. right? As, as, and that, that line of bottles has changed over time. Mm-hmm. And two years from now, it might be different. As I find out new things, as I, as people, uh, some of the ways I found out about things, I get emails. What do you think about this? And I right. look it up. I'm like, wow, that is beneficial. I'm going to add that. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I deployed or when I had times that I was traveling, that I couldn't take all those bottles with me. Right. You know, it's, uh, you know, a chewable, you know, whether it was a Centrum or even a Flintstone multivitamin, um, whenever you were deployed, the the clinic always had boxes and boxes and boxes of Flintstone multivitamins. (laughs) And so it was readily available. So I chew one or two of those in the morning. And that's, you know, I, is, is it giving me some things I don't need? Probably is, you know, are there some things that I need that aren't in it? Also probably yes. but. I'm getting some of the basics. I'm getting, I'm getting my B vitamins. I'm getting my, my D my C I'm getting some of my trace minerals that I need. And so it's better than nothing. Right. Okay. Good. Good. Well, man, I've enjoyed this so far. I think that there's no possible way that we could um, not do another one of these. I have so many questions and uh, I don't know how much time you have, but we'll probably, we'll probably start to bring this to a close, but I'd really like to have you on again. We have so much to, to talk about. Um, and I'd love to get out there. If I get to Austin, I'd love to come train with you and check out yeah. and see what, what you do, um, on a, on a regular basis. That would be, that'd that'd be, be awesome. really fun. I will be getting out there. Um, and, uh, that'd be, that'd be super cool. Um, so how do, um, uh, so your book is called honed um, what's the, what's the tagline to it? Keeping your edge after 40. Is that what it uh, is? Finding your edge as a man over 40. Okay. Yep. Honed, finding your edge as a man over 40. And where is that available on Amazon and everywhere else or what? Uh, Amazon, barnesandnoble.com. It really, anywhere that you would buy a book online, it should be available. Most of the sales of Amazon is everybody's go-to now. So obviously that's where, where most of the books are selling, but it was a uh, bestseller. If, if, it was an Amazon bestseller, uh, still is in, I, I think eight categories. So, uh, health and fitness, men's health, uh, ab workouts, strength training, uh, and a few other ones. Nice. So, Good job, actually, man. F- for, for a week, I was beating out Hicks and Gracie's book in one of those categories. Well, I read that book <laughs> recently too. Um, yeah. yeah, really, really good. Um, yeah, I, I, I like halfway that book. through it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so do book. you have any plans on making your book an audio book? Yeah, that's going to take some time. I didn't have, uh, because I self-published, you know, I didn't, uh, I, I, I wish this would have been, you know, random house gave me, gave me uh, a stipend up front to, to write this book. And that's not the way that it worked out. Uh, so I, I self-published everything out of pocket and, uh, I, in order to do the audio portion, uh, that was a little bit more capital than I had right outside of the gate. So my mm-hmm. plan is, uh, through the book sales, I'm going to put those right back into financing the audiobook. Um, unfortunately, it's about a six month process for the audiobook to come. Is out. that right? Seems yeah, like you got a good microphone there. You got good audio. You could just read it yourself. Yeah. Well, I am going to read it myself, but that's, um, 
it's the the company that that I'm going to use to do it. You know, they they have a specific studio they want you to mm-hmm. sit down in, and a specific editor. and And I'm imagining I'm going to have to read every page or every paragraph two or three times so they can pick you know just just the right version of it. But right. they said they said it uh, it probably will take less time than that. Just the the amount of time that they told me it was going to take to publish, it ended up being published in about half that time. So they probably just give you that six month time frame so that you feel pretty good when it comes out in three. That's awesome, man. Have you ever written a book before? Nope. This is my first one. Well, good job, man. Yeah. Put it right up there and, and, and outsell, outsell a big book like that and be top seller in so many different categories, man. That's, that's awesome. That's yeah, awesome. I've been, I've been really pleased. And, and what's pleased me the most is that is, uh, I love reading the reviews. I love getting the emails from people that say, Hey, I've, I've read it. I'm already incorporating it. Even, you know, I've gotten a, a couple emails from, uh, current or former professional athletes hmm. who, who I would think, uh, you know, you've, you've got this down and they're telling me things like, uh, my sleep is a, is a dumpster fire. I'm going to do everything you're saying in your sleep category. I had another guy, you know, former professional fighter tell me, um, I, I never go to the doctor because I don't need to, because I'm healthy. Now you've told me all these things that I should be doing, all these lab values. I should be getting checked. I've scheduled a colonoscopy an eye exam, a skin cancer screening, Thank you for, so very much for for telling me to do this so that I would get on it. So I, I think there's something for anybody, even somebody, you know, I mean, you, you've you obviously got the recipe. You're you're very physically fit. So, you know, I, I hope that that even for you, you found. Some, no, I got a ton out of it. I got a ton out of it. And what I liked about it, too, is is, um, you know, I had to be very careful in my choice of a of a personal physician because, you know, I just can't go in there and see some giant fat person that's telling me that my, my, my BMI is too high. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. I've got a six pack when when you're, when your BMI is muscle. Yeah. And, and, (laughs) and they're, they just don't have any idea. I'm like, I want to check my vitamin D and they don't understand why. Oh, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. You're out in the sun all the time. I'm like, no, I want to check my vitamin D. I want to check all this stuff. So I was very careful about, choosing a doctor that was also an athlete and that understood Mm -hmm. what my goals were. And when I read your book, I see what your background is. I see where your mindset is. I see where you're coming from. And then you're giving me this advice and I'm like, okay, that's a guy like me that feels like, you know, you should get vaccinated for shingles. Like, okay, I'm going to pay attention to that. Mm-hmm. Because you've obviously seen it, you're not just you, you have you you could care less whether I do it or not. You have zero um, invested in this, so you have you're not going to profit from it one bit if I get a shingle shot. Like, mm-hmm. and and because you're like me, you're you do the same kind of workouts, you're doing all of this stuff, and you're about my age. I'm going to take your advice way more than I'm going to take a doctor's advice that is 27 and, you know, has never felt like what it feels like to be 50. Right. <laughs> you know, right. so I got a ton out of it and I thought that, that it was extremely well-written. I thought that it was well-organized. And, um, I think that anyone that is, is approaching 40 or over 40 is going to get a lot out of it. I re- I really do. And, um, it, you know, good job all around. I, I really liked Thank it. You. I really Thank liked you so it. Much. Um, well, let's let's that. do this again. I would really yeah, like to. And to. Um, you know, when we have some medical kind of uh, questions or or other things, I'd love to be able to call you and and have you on the show again. Um, anytime. Yeah. So anytime. Uh, as far as um, your other stuff, do you have like a personal website or anything like that, or social media that you want to give out? Yeah. Uh, so you can follow me on Instagram. Uh, at Dr. Mike Simpson, that's doctor with a DR, not spelled all the way out. Um, graybeardperformance.com is my business website. I have a personal website that's drmikesimpson.com. Um, although I tend to do most of what I do over at Graybeard now and uh, up to and including, I'm even going to start doing a newsletter and a, and a blog over on that site because I want it to be, I want Graybeard Performance to be a very holistic life and lifestyle, one stop shopping not just supplements, not just Brazilian jiu-jitsu fight gear and my book, but, you know, I, I want to keep supplementing that because I keep learning as I go, you know, mm-hmm. there, there might be things, uh, that there might be things that I add to from book chapters in the future. Uh, and I, and I want to do them 
you know, through that, through my website. And, and I want it to be a place that people can go as a resource. And maybe someday I can grow it to the point when we talk about finding a tribe that, that maybe I can have, uh, you know, message boards and mm-hmm. Reddit boards in there where, where you can link up with tribes right there on the website that overall, that would be my overarching goal over time. That'd be super cool. If, as long as it doesn't get overtaken by porn spam. That's what happened to my, <laughs> my message board. I had a message board that was very active and, and it just got to be just ridiculous. I mean, it, yeah. you just couldn't keep that, track of that it. or the comments that, Hey, I made $5,000 yeah. a day at home. <laughs> you get those because, too. You know, yeah. Oh, I don't, so I don't get those on my social media, but I follow so many accounts that do Yeah. that, you know, uh, you know, Dr. So-and-so, so-and-so yeah. showed me the way to make $5,000 at home. I don't know how that benefits anybody. Does anybody click that? I mean, I don't see how no. that is a- at all beneficial, but yeah. anyway, it happens. And unfortunately, yep, sure does. Um, unfortunately, that's, that's the death of the message board. I think now you have to just yeah. go to Reddit. Like it, it'd probably be better to, to, to create a Reddit thread and, and, and like put that on your website rather than trying to do it yourself because you just, yeah, maybe, it just maybe gets so. overrun. But uh, yeah, man, well, you should, you should definitely be able to, to handle that. You're certainly an authority and you look like you're 35 and you're 50, 55. And, and, uh, it's pretty, pretty impressive, man. You've been able to do, you're, you're doing great things and you're going to help a lot of Thank people. You. So, um, we'll do it again, but thanks Mike. I appreciate it. And, um, if anybody wants to read this book, I, I highly suggest it. Go get it. Amazon. All right. Thank you, Tom. All right. We'll see you.